and, and decide if it is better to do it in one leap or to do it in two. Um, I would think that if you're not sure of yourself, that it might be best to write it as a function and then go and, and put it in the class. So to follow the same sequence. If you're pretty confident, maybe you've done this before, um, then you might want to take the leap and, and just put it in the class to start. All right. Keep in mind that, that object-oriented programming and classes and objects are really a topic all unto itself. Um, I wanted to show you in this class how you use custom business objects that you create. If you take what you should, like the advanced VB class, you'll study advanced object, you know, you'll study objects in a lot more detail and learn to do a lot neater things with it. All right. Just consider this to be at least sort of an, uh, 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 an introduction of the fact that, yeah, you can use custom classes here, and we want to pay some attention to the code that we're creating and create code that's reusable. So that's sort of as much as we're going to talk about creating custom classes uh, for this class. Yes? So you wouldn't have a problem if we did our projects like that? Like what? Had a separate class and went through and did it hooked to the uh, program where it uses its uh, functions in that in the class instead of right on the uh, web app. Yeah, you can use a custom class. That's, that's what I'm essentially doing this part. The class should be part of the web app, yeah. but yeah, sure. That's the way you call it's not going to change. Shouldn't, yeah. Okay, good. Well, oh, no, the way I call it? Yeah, the way I call it is going to change. All right. That was my second part. We only did half the chore here. Okay. We, we took the code out of the page and created it in the custom class. No squiggly lines, so that's a good sign. But if we look over here, we do get a squiggly line. Why? Because it doesn't know where to find that function now. So we have to tell it where to find it. That's not that hard to do. What we have to do is create a variable that will contain an object of that type. So I will say dim conv as new conversion. All right. So I'm making a variable, and I'm saying this variable is of this type. In object-oriented terms, this is the class. This is a specific member of the class. Now that we have a member of that class, we can call any functions on that class, right? Simply by saying, on this object, call this function. So on my conversion object, call convert temperature. Now it knows, hey, the CONV variable is of type conversion. So that function, convert temperature, must live in that conversion class. So it can call that, um, can call that function, and it knows where to find it. You know, who knows? I might have a convert temperature function in a different object or a different class, maybe for a totally different purpose. All right. Well, it has to know where to find the function. It finds a function this way. We make a variable of that type, and we use that variable to point to the class, or the object in class that we want to use. Now, we should be okay. All right. And if we run this, we should be back in business. And it gives us those results, which I assume are correct. Gives us those results. Now, a good exercise might be to take this and try to make a second page that uses the same function. Let's go and do that. We have about 10 minutes left. We should be able to do that, no problem. So. To prove 
our success here, I want to make a second page that has a text box. And let's say I only want to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. Okay? And we'll do it with a drop down. All right? That will contain certain temperatures. And I only want to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade. So let's go in here. Um, let's create a new page. I'll create a web form. Let's do it for laughs with a radio button group. A radio button list. I'm going to add a radio button list. And I'm just going to put a couple items in here because I think we can see that if we do one, we can, we, if we do two temperatures, we can do 2,000. All right. So let's edit items. And I will say, freezing point, which is what? 32 Fahrenheit. Boiling point. which is 212 Fahrenheit. I'm going to make this an auto post back so that I don't have to have a button. All right? And I'm going to put my results in a label. Okay. I double click on that and it gives me the radio button changed event event. Selected index changed event. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to go in I'm going to do this. I'm going to do dim C as new conversion. <coughs> dim ANS as double. Now, the way this is set up, I only want to do Fahrenheit to centigrade, so I don't need a selection. I, just, I can hard code that value in. And I can say ANS equals C dot convert temperature. What do I need to give the, the, the temperature uh, function, the convert temperature function? I need to give it the temperature I want to convert. Well, where am I getting that from? From my radio button list. Radio button list one dot selected value. What is the conversion that I want to do? I want to do Fahrenheit to centigrade. Once I do that, I can take that answer and I can say label one dot text equals ANS. Now, let's run this and take a look. I click freezing point, tells me freezing point in centigrade is zero, which is correct. I click boiling point, tells me the boiling point is 100, which is correct. I go back and forth. Now, how does that work? Let's look at the HTML it produces. That drop down. or not drop down, I'm sorry, radio button list, has first radio button has a value of 32. The description of it is freezing. The second radio button has a value of 212. Its description is boiling point. All right? Remember, radio buttons, drop downs always work that way where they have what the user sees and what the value sort of behind the scenes is that's going to be used in calculations. So, when we go in and write the code to do this, what are we accessing? We're accessing the value of the thing that's selected. 
So if freezing was selected, would get a 32 there. If boiling was selected, would get a 212 there. Since we know that we only want to do Fahrenheit to centigrade, there's nothing on the page that tells us what we want to do. We can just hard code that. Now, to be sure there's ways that we could improve this to make this cooler, uh, we'll leave that for Nora to teach in, in, in uh, the advanced VB class. But notice again, the calling program is responsible for getting the inputs together. In this case, it got the temperature from the radio buttons. It got the conversion type from just being hard-coded, because it knows it always wants to do that kind of conversion. So it, has, it gathered the input together, it calls the function, and then it has to do something with the results. All right? And in this case, we're just popping it out in a label. We could format that label if we wanted to. We could do all sorts of things with that label um, uh, if we wanted to. Yeah. Now, that class that you created uh, mm -hmm. and the second page, mm -hmm. I'll know about that class because it's there. Right? Yes. Now, if you moved it somewhere to a different directory, would it still be able to find it? Um, there's ways that you can register it so that it would find it if it was part of another application or whatever. Yeah. The assumption here is that this is this will be part of this web app, so it will be in that place. Can you keep a function in a database? Can you keep a function in a database? Some databases support stored procedures, which would be like a function in a database. Uh, but it, it, it's, as my dad would always say, it's the same but different. All right. Uh, so kind of. Um, if, if, the, if the function that you're talking about is concerned with database actions, then yeah, you might want to put it in a database. If it's a function like this, which is more of a business rule sort of thing, then you probably would have a class to do it as opposed to storing it in, 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 a, in a database. And then you can hide that logic if you don't want somebody to see the Who? proprietary. Well, remember, this is all the client's going to see, right? They're just going to see the HTML, so they don't see that code. We're in uh, a unique position where we're developing and running it on the same machine so we can see the code, but the client is only going to see the HTML. That leads me to another question. Uh -huh. Good answer. If uh, I go to a website and I see they're running an ASP page, I know that certain classes are going to be available. I could write my own page, run it against their server, and do malicious things if I wanted to. Probably not. How would you know what classes are being used? Well, I mean, all of that, that classes will be there. Okay. The built-in ones will, yeah. yeah. Um, how are you going to know how to connect to their database? How are you going to know well, to connect their, database. yeah. Um, it's, it, just doing that, it's doubtful that, you, that, that you, could, you could do much, I would say. Let's format our let's format our answer to use the text property of the radio button list. So now when we run it, we can say that. We can say that we forgot to convert that to string. Boiling point in centigrade is 100. Freezing point in centigrade is 0. So again, we use the object of we use the item object that was selected, and from the item we pull the selected text. All right. So the class wouldn't be considered an object, but the, uh, you create an object from that class. Uh, consider a class to be a template for an object. Um, 
in, in other cases, you, for example, you would make a, a class for student, let's say. And that will contain a template of all the information that you would know about a student and a list of all the methods that a student could perform. You know, a student can enroll for a class, can drop a class, can graduate, and all that. So you define that with the functionality, with, with the properties that a student's going to have, like name and student number and that sort of thing, and the methods that a student can perform. That's sort of the, the, the blueprint for a student. If I wanted to make a model of this class then, uh, I'm using class a couple different ways, but if I want to make a, a, a model for this section, I would go and make one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, objects. Yeah, nine class. objects of type student. And each object would correspond to a member of this course. All right, and then uh, then I could manipulate those. And in each, for each student, I would know it would have the same properties. I know it would have the same methods associated with them. All right. I'm going to post this and the video up. Um, I'll first go and make sure the door's unlocked over there. All right, first thing. Do remember that I'm leaving today at 1220, so you only get your regular amount of lab time. You don't get the extra bonus. And um, I'm going to come back here and grab the example and the videos. And then I'll be back over that.